Hi, this is Greg Kilstrom. Welcome to season three of the Agile World, where we discuss customer and employee experience, organizational and workforce transformation, and how business can adapt and continually improve in an Agile age. The Agile World podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed in this show, you can go to my website at theagile.world and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the host of the Agile World podcast. Today, we're going to talk about building a customer-centric organization and how to balance profits, technology, and culture while doing so. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Elenia Vidili, Customer Experience Advisor and author of the book, Journey to Centricity. Elenia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Greg. That's a nice presentation. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, looking forward to, to talking here. So let's, let's get started by talking about your book, Journey to Centricity. Um, why did you choose to write a book about customer-centric companies? Why do you think that's important? So writing a book has been on my list for a very long time. And um, to give you a short answer, I really believe that if business leaders put the people, so customers and employees at the center of their organization, we would have better companies and therefore a better business world. So a lot of, of my clients and potential clients have been asking me, where do we start from? How can you do this? So I thought of putting together um, three main pillars, the humanity pillar, technology pillar, and culture pillar, which I believe are the three main elements for uh, building a successful customer-centric organization. Right. My vision on, of customer centricity is that companies should live and breathe their customers and find really innovative and sustainable ways to make a difference in their lives, but also in society and in the world. So this book, so with this book, I really want to touch upon a lot of social economic issues that the world is experiencing today and how these are shaping uh, new people, consumer behavior in the very fabric of society. So I really want to focus the book on uh, the new generation of consumers, which um, are the ones that are revolutionizing consumer behavior um, as a whole. And um, I really wanted to help the, the reader with three important points. How can companies leave the old process in thinking behind Second, how can they leverage the single most important assets they have, so they are customers? And lastly, what can be a formula, or I also call them the guiding principles in their battle to become customer-centric, which is not an easy, an yeah. easy battle. There's, there's been a, a big shift. I come from the, the marketing world and um, you know that, that shift from really being that broadcasting marketing messages to really being customer centric. I think it's, it's been a long time coming, but it's, you know, it's exciting to hear people like yourself talking more and more about this and, and giving practical advice. I think, I think everyone kind of agrees that they agree on the premise, right? That it's important, but I, I, mm -hmm. I like that you're giving, um, ways and methods to actually implement that. And I think, you know, a big part of that um, does um, come down to leadership, right? Leadership um, leading the way. What? How would you describe leadership's role in, in building a customer-centric culture? So it's a question that I often get asked and um, as, is also a chapter of my book. I, I'm yeah. going to place this in the culture pillar because I believe it's a very important part, it's a very important part of uh, the culture of an organization. So, so, you know, Greg, most leaders think they are customer focused and they're focused on their customers, but they really aren't. Right. <laughs> so, um, I challenge you to find a CEO that doesn't say so. Um, so first, a leader of the company, they really need to demonstrate a genuine commitment to customer focus. So, and real change comes from the top. So, the percentage of the people, of the leadership um, of a company that uh, um, is really actually focused on customer centricity is really, really low. But if we want to change um, a culture, if we want to change 
um, a company and become more customer centric, then leadership really need to believe in it, have a clear vision, identify key people who can push the project forward. And uh, I believe that the, if the top uh, doesn't really understand the importance of being customer centric in this hyper competitive landscape, this will never happen. Because, yeah. of course, you don't really walk in a company one day and say, okay, today we're going to change the culture of this company, you know, and we're going to be more customer centric. So it really needs to come from the leaders that need to push the project, that really need to envision uh, the commitment. And um, customer centricity is your approach with your customers, right? It's, it's, it's not something that happens overnight by pressing a button. It just doesn't doesn't work like that, you know? Yeah. So every decision that is taken, uh, every business decision that is taken must be done to serve customers better. For example, um, I was talking to a business leader uh, for, uh, for my book um, last month, and he said that every time there is a new decision to be taken, whether there is a logistic decision or whether there is a finance decision, the board sits down all together and they actually ask the question, does this help my customers and my employee? If yes, then okay, they go ahead with it. If they doesn't, then... Is not, um, is, is, yeah. is, is it not, uh, it doesn't deserve to be a decision to be taken. So another thing that I want to, um, I want to express the concept a little bit more um, thoroughly is uh, as I've been researching and talking to psychologists about empathy, um, an interesting thing that I found is that empathy is contagious, right? And most people who observe empathy feel more empathic themselves in a particular moment. We always talk about be a more empathic business and how to, um, how to spread empathy with customers, right? Yeah. But it comes really from the leadership. Because if we don't feel as employees, uh, you know, just if, for example, in contact centers, if you don't feel your boss, your manager, or the top, the leadership top, um, be more empathic with you, for example, then you won't be able to be more empathic with your with the customers. So it's like a chain. It's like children, basically, when they um, they observe their parents being more empathic, do good for society, then they automatically learn from their parents. And it's exactly the same thing. So it really comes from, uh, from the leadership. So customer-centric leaders are the ones that provide the direction the purpose to the employees who then pass it to the customers. Yeah, no, that's, the, I like the way you put that. Uh, what, what about technology's role in, in all of this? I mean, it's, you know, tool, technology, tools, software, all of that not only affects the customer directly, but it's, you know, it's often how employees mm -hmm. are interacting and, and things like that. What's, what's, what's the, how do you balance technology with this, this need for customer centricity? So, in as I said earlier, in the second, uh, the second pillar of my book, we'll talk about technology, and the first one talk about humanity. So, the humanity of a business. More precisely, I'll talk about purpose, human connection, trust, empathy. So, Greg, we went from companies being completely skeptical about digital, it's not been it completely, to now to wanting to have the latest piece of tech at the cost of losing focused on customers and employees. And these really adds stress on, on us, customers and employees, and lose empathy, and therefore customer engagement, and eventually consumer trust. So I'm not really against tech and digital at all. Don't get me yeah. wrong. I just think that in a world of a lot of changes and challenges, we really need businesses that care less about the brightest piece of their products or the, the, the brightest piece of uh, software, but they care more about the people inside and outside the organization. And I'm going to make you a couple of examples here. Yeah. So technology in most ways has a really positive effect on business operations. And uh, for example, especially in the automation of admin processes, such as communication with customers, right? But the problem is that most companies believe that these digital tools can improve customer engagement like a miracle. Yeah. 
So the plugin, a few um, engagement softwares are to automate customer interactions and they think that the job is done, but it doesn't really work like that. Yeah. So the reality is that these technologies are greatly designed to replicate some sort of friendliness, but are simply not able to offer the much needed level of human connection that we need today, that customers need today. So yes, tech can help greatly, but we have to compensate and balance it out with all other customer-focused initiatives. Um, in other words, you know, for example, uh, the customer center, uh, the, sorry, the contact centers um, are the uh, customer touch points that uh, is um, not the most automated, but companies want to automate it as much as possible, right? Uh, by using chatbots, for example, or uh, by automating um, what uh, employees have to say over the phone with scripts and uh, things like that. But the thing is, the uh, automating customer contact centers and other customer interactions is the worst customer touch point to automate because contact center is you know, is the most important touch point that spreads empathy and increases customer trust. It's the only touch point where customers feel listened to, understood, feel valued. And um, one example that um, I wanted to make is uh, during the pandemic, an insurance, an insurance company wasn't really getting many customer service calls for obvious reasons because customers weren't really traveling from point A to point B and, you know, everything was... Um, yeah. was closed. So the leaders decided to proactively call the customers and actually ask them how the customers were doing, right? So you see the shift in thinking and mindset here. The yeah. important point here, here wasn't really to wait for calls to come in, but to actually check in on customers and make sure that our customers were okay or just exchanging a few words to say, hey, we are here if you need us. And that really generates a high level of trust and empathy. Um, mm. So the point here is to, um, it's, you know, it's to balance it out, to try to balance out the interaction between the automation and um, the, the actual human um, connection that we need. Everything is automated today. Everything is hyper-digital. And some companies really, you don't have any way to talk to a physical uh, touch point because, or an actual person because everything is hyper automated. And so you talk to, um, so you get to talk to chatbots, for example, and um, you, you, they don't really understand what you, what you need or what you're talking about. So there right. is this disconnection, you see. And, and that's why I believe that, yes, technology is really important, but we really, we still need people um, to balance out uh, the soft skills that are highly needed. Yeah, let's um, let's let's get back to another point that you were talking about as well, and you know, um, which I, I totally agree with, which is you know what what company out there would say that they don't love their customers and and treat them as high priority, but when it really comes down to it, um, you know, do they do they really uh, let's you know to use the expression, do they put their money where their mouth is, mm. um, and so. You know, which I think is actually part of the problem. You know, what I hear a lot, and I'd be definitely curious what, what your thoughts are there as well, is, you know, these are often talking points and these are often things that, you know, well, well intentioned, but when it comes down to spending dollars mm -hmm. or saving dollars on one thing over the other, it just seems like some of this customer centric and customer experience in general stuff, even employee experience stuff, um, tends to be deprioritized for, for other like short-term goals. So, you know, what's your, how, how do you counsel companies to, it's a, it's almost a way of long-term thinking, but you know, how do you counsel companies to like keep their eye on the, on, on, on the goal? It's, that's a big question, Craig. I, yeah. always, <laughs> I, I often get it. I, I often get this question asked. Um, so just to be clear, Every organization is out there to make money. That's a fact, right, and right. that's absolutely okay, right? We shouldn't judge companies, oh, are you there to make money? Well, you know, we need to survive. We need to make money. Right. But the difference is 
between those companies that are out there to serve a big purpose, to serve their customers and society, whilst also making profit. And those companies that want to sell as many products and services as possible to make as much profit as possible at the expense of their people and of society. That's the difference. So I believe that profit should be seen as an outcome of customer centricity initiatives rather than the sole objective of a company. And um, so, you know, Craig, here we're talking about basically shareholder primacy versus creating stakeholder value, right? And uh, over the last um, six months, I've been interviewing a lot of companies um, a lot of companies that I believe are customer centric and that are going to be best practice examples for my book and for many in my book for many um, for for the world or for many companies out there. So again, here we're talking about mindset. We're talking about culture, approach, and leadership. If you walk in a company that lives and breathe and breathe the sole purpose of making money, that's what you are going to work towards, right? Yeah. Being customer centric, it doesn't mean that a company doesn't make money, but it means that it's adopting a different approach to make money. So right. I believe that, that today the things that are changing, um, and if you things are changing, and if your customers sniff and feel that you are in the market with the sole purpose of selling to them rather than serving them they are quickly going to run away from the capitalist view of your company and go to another company which believes and values much with theirs. Yeah, no, that's uh, that, that makes sense. So how about um, measuring um, growth towards, you know, so there's every, every company has different metrics and, um, you know, there's obviously there's a lot of different mm-hmm. factors that go into play as far as measuring customer experience and, and stuff like that. But how do you, um, I think measuring progress, um, towards this goal, right? Cause I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, from my perspective, customer centricity, it's a, you know, it's, it's a goal that you achieve over time. It's not a, you know, okay, now we're, Absolutely. now we're done. Right. Yeah. So how, how do you, um, how do you think about measuring progress towards that goal? Like what are, what are some of the ways that you, um, you know, counsel companies to, to think in, in doing that? So I think you mean in terms of metrics, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. got you. Um, well, I'm not a big fan of metrics. Um, I mean, there are some metrics that work better than others, of course. I think the most important thing that you that you can do as a company to to measure the success is um, when you when you really see that all employees are feeling more motivated to do their job are feeling to more motivated to help customers and to work towards the same purpose. Um, so whether you measure the success with an MPS, with a customer satisfaction score, or et cetera, I think the most important thing that you can do is to share those, the results, the actual results and the happiness of your customers with every employee so that every employee understands where they're actually helping um, the customer. Right. Yeah. In other words, for example, the logistic people, so a lot of companies and organizations don't really understand where they are helping their customers. And our job as customer experience professionals and the leaders of the companies, they really need to be able to say, hey, you work in delivering your, your, the parcel to, you, to the customer. Excellent. This is how you're helping the customer in making them feel more valued. Um, so these are the ways, for example, um, and other ways like in customer service, for example, or the ways that we can help customers or feel, sorry, employees feel more valued, um, or having a bigger, bigger purpose. Um, for example, we have seen a lot of companies like Ben and Jerry's, they have been an active, um, activist, uh, brand in pursuing their purpose, but also sharing their voice. And they've been having a lot of support from customers. And that only doesn't, it, that doesn't really strengthen only the relationship with customers, but it strengthens the relationship with employees because employees are pushing 
uh, the project forward and that working towards a stronger purpose, you see. So I think what, what you really can measure is the satisfaction that your employees feel and see every day. It's how motivated they, they, they are um, to working towards helping their customers. Yeah. So that's my... Uh, my advice. There are many different metrics, and of course, the metrics are important. But I think that the, the the only KPI that is important is to see the motivation of employees. Yeah, no, that that, that makes sense. Um, well, um, one one last question before we wrap up here. Um, I, you know, as a fellow author, I, I always like to ask about the process of of writing books and and stuff. So. Can you talk a little bit about that process? You 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 mentioned you've been doing some interviews and, and things like that, but we'd love to just kind of hear um, about your process and you know any any takeaways, anything you learned through that the process of of actually writing the book. Oh sure. Um, so as you as you probably know, it's a, it's a crazy amount of work. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't think it was going to be this hard. Um, in this book, there are. 20 interviewees between senior executive executive of companies that I believe are contributing positively to their customers and beyond, university professors and professionals in the field of customer experience and beyond. Um, As we have seen, customer centricity is not just about answering the phone or removing frictions from the customer journey, but it's a lot about leadership, the culture, the purpose, and et cetera. So I've also interviewed thought leaders in this field. So the first, um, the first step was to actually um, map out the framework, so the structure of the book, right? Um, as I said, the book is uh, divided into three pillars, and every pillar has their elements. So these pillars and their elements, they constitute a framework um, or guiding principles, right, that um, companies should follow um so that's that's the first step so to actually think um thoroughly about the structure of the framework and of the book um the second step was to discover the companies and the professionals that i wanted to be as protagonist of my book and this was a huge amount of work for many reasons number one because looking for these people wasn't an easy task and you know actually um, getting hold of them and um, yeah. getting responses, right? Getting getting them in, interested in what I'm doing. So I had to contact about 150 potential interviewees to be able to sign a publicity release with 20 of them. So as you know, is yeah, quite a big, wow. big yeah, that's a, that's work. a lot of people, yeah. yeah. And um, and then the second sec- second struggle was because. You know, when there are companies involved, there are many departments involved, and um, I interviewed C-suite executives. So it gets really complicated in terms of times, um, contract sign, and then people involved. So it gets so the people involved were not just the C-suite executive, but also the PR people, for example, and then the legal people. Mm, so there were a lot of people involved. So getting them all. At the same time, for example, and the goal agree, um, it was a little bit challenging. So then the third step was to obviously start the manuscript, which took me about four months, and I'm now finalizing it. Um, so that, that's a lot of work. A lot well, that's of exciting, yeah. huge amount of research, <laughs> reading books, and and reports, and and, and all the interviews, fans of hundreds of hours of interviews with with people. And the fourth step is the approval bit. So all the people that I've interviewed so far, they have the chance to review the content and the mentions in a respective chapter. So that's yeah. another layer of, uh, of work, right? So yeah. and then we've come to the fifth step, <laughs> which is the editing bit. And this involves three types of editing. And um, as, as you know, and then there's the final, the final step, which is the design of the cover and the, the layout, the layout of the text. And then lastly is the launch. So I'll be launching in September. Um, as with every product and service, a book needs a proper launch. So proper uh, marketing activities and all the 
um, um, communication, PR and communication, and um, you know, and a lot of initiatives, uh, a lot of interactions with the outside world to let them know that this book is is getting launched. So as you can see, it's not an easy thing, and um, that yeah. you can do in two months, as many people think. But um, but I mean, it needs uh, thought of thinking, and uh, it's, it's an actual project. It's like is a nearly nearly 12 months project. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's definitely yeah, no, that's um it's definitely I, I think you you said it well. It's um a lot of people I think that get um haven't done it for the first time, you know, they they think it's going to be relatively straightforward, but I mean just given yeah. all the things that you mentioned, all of those are critical pieces of it and you know, if you shortchange one, then you know, you're not going to have a um, as successful, uh, uh, an end product. So no, we'll get best of, best of luck with, as you, as you finish you. things up. I know there's still, <laughs> you've done a lot of work, it sounds like, but there's still, you know, still a lot of work yet to be yeah. done. So I wish you the best with that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and, and Alenia, thanks so much for joining the show. Um, for those listening, um, what's the best way for them to keep up with what you're doing? So I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, people can find me on LinkedIn, uh, you know, just uh, type in my name, Elenia Vidili, or I have my personal website, which is eleniavidili.com. And, and obviously my book is coming out in September. So I'll be announcing in a couple of months time, once we have the last pieces um, tied up and um, yeah, finally. Yeah. <laughs> <we'll be done. laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, um, thanks again. I'd like to thank Alenia Vidili for, uh, thank for joining you, the show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks for listening to the Agile World with Greg Kelstrom. Uh, see you next week. Thanks again for listening to the Agile World podcast brought to you by Tech Systems. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can learn more and get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, from my website at theagile.world.